The setting for this story is Hornsey, North London. The year is 1921. Eight Ferristone Road was the home of the Frost family, and the household was a busy one. It consisted of the elderly Mr. and Mrs. Frost, their son Ivan Frost, his wife, their two adult sons, and the three orphaned children of Ivan's sister, who had passed away in April of 1920 from tuberculosis. Her children were Gordon, Bertie and Muriel Parker, who were 11, 9 and 5 years old respectively. By the time the Frost family made the national newspapers that year, they had for some time, according to them, been witness to an array of poltergeist activity within their home. If the family's accounts were to be believed, these events were both violent and relentless. Furniture, candlesticks, food and a flat iron were thrown about the house, and young Gordon Parker was narrowly missed by a kitchen knife when it glided past him, its blade then piercing a wall. Lumps of coal were also said to have been hurled from the fireplace. In fact, the mystery surrounding the coal is where the Frost family story began. It was New Year's Day 1921. An exceptionally cold winter had taken hold, and Mr Frost had just received his regular order of coal. When the fuel was stored in the cellar, the family were alarmed when the unlit coal began to spit, hiss and move around. When placed in the fire grate, the coal was flung from the hearth, hitting the walls and smashing windows. Ivan Frost, believing that the coal must have been mixed with some kind of explosive, called in the police and the fire brigade. When both authorities investigated, they too witnessed it. When speaking to journalists on January 31st, 1921, Mr Frost said, When big lumps leapt out of the fire and broke the kitchen windows, we thought some sort of explosive had got mixed up with the coal. But when other lumps smashed windows and damaged the furniture in the dining room, we cleared all the coal out into the garden. Last night, some of it reappeared in the house. When the story of the Frost family's plight went public, they were met with a great deal of ridicule. Neighbours laughed at Mr Frost's descriptions, despite friends of the family and authoritative figures attesting to have also witnessed the phenomenon. The Dundee newspaper The Sunday Post was particularly unsympathetic when they reported on Friday, February 20th. Making reference to the current political climate surrounding coal miners, they ended their report by saying that even if Robert Smiley had entered the house, there would be no rise in coal. It's interesting that the coal aspect of this story has been the main focus historically, with the case widely being known as the Hornsey Coal Poltergeist. When you look at the entire story though, one might say that it was a minor factor. There was a theory that disgruntled mine workers had mixed explosives with the coal, something that was later proved false. These theories arose when, in 1921, a woman was killed in her Guildford home when hot coal exploded from the grate. However, this does not take into account the fact that the coal at Ferristone Road was unlit, nor does it explain how the coal began to inexplicably reappear in the house once it had been moved to the garden, even ascending several steps and reaching the upper floors of the building. The coal aspect aside, we now come to Tuesday the 15th of February. According to Ivan Frost, this was the day everything went from bad to worse. He said that that evening Gordon Parker, his nephew, was unwell, so he shared a bed with him that night so he could watch over him. Gordon was shivering uncontrollably, and then suddenly became still and cold to the touch. That's when rapping noises were heard coming from the next room, followed by three loud taps at the bedroom window. On investigation, nothing was found, and the night passed without further incident. It wasn't until the next morning, when the family made their way downstairs, that they saw that the plates, cutlery and a pack of playing cards had been thrown to the ground, although no sounds had woken them during the night. After the mess was cleaned up and they all sat down to breakfast, Ivan Frost said that the heavy mahogany table lifted, spilling the milk. He said that the chair Gordon was seated on then rose two feet from the ground, throwing him off, and then rose almost to the ceiling before falling to the ground. The family sought the help of Reverend A. L. Gardner of St. Gabriel's Church in Wood Green, according to the Nottingham Evening Post and other newspapers that covered the story. The Reverend was more than a little vague when speaking on the matter, simply stating that he had witnessed some strange occurrences within the house. The editor of Occult Review magazine, Ralph Shirley, 
also spoke on the case. He said, Similar cases have occurred in every country and no solution has been found. Many people believe the work is that of spirits moving through a sympathetic medium, and I have known unconscious mediums. Maybe someone in the Hornsey house is a medium. On Saturday, February the 19th, large crowds gathered outside of 8 Ferristone Road after it was leaked that members of the Psychical Research Society were there. Police managed to move several large groups on, but smaller groups hung around in the shadows until the late hours. Newspapers reported that the Psychical Research Society had witnessed one of the boys levitating while seated on a wooden chair, and had stated that they were confident that there was no trickery involved. It's often said that poltergeist activity is brought on when an adolescent person either lives in or enters a home, that person having become the vessel for a malevolent spirit. It's a theory that has been supported with evidence many times over the years. With this in mind, it was decided that 11-year-old Gordon Parker would be moved away from the house. He was sent 82 miles away to the coastal town of Broadstairs in Kent in the hope that the activity would stop. It did die down apparently, but did not cease completely. When Gordon Parker returned in March, it was worse than before. His sister, five-year-old Muriel Parker, who up until this time was said to have coped quite well with the events, became anxious as her young mind tried to understand what was happening around her. Then, on April the 3rd, it was reported that a chair on which Muriel was seated was hurled into the air, throwing her to the ground. The incident caused her to bite her tongue. She became unwell after this and struggled to cope. The family said that for a period of nine days she got progressively worse. Sadly, Muriel Parker died on Thursday, March 31st, 1921. After an examination, a doctor said that meningitis had been the cause, but nerve strain had almost certainly accelerated her death. Muriel's uncle Ivan Frost was convinced that the haunting was directly responsible for her death. He said, Skeptical people have laughed at the ghost stories, and have said that we've caused all the happenings ourselves. Perhaps the death of my little niece will convince them that we are not responsible. While the family looked for a new home, Gordon and Bertie Parker went to stay with some friends of the family in Brockley, South London. On April 30th, it was reported that Gordon had suffered a seizure while in Brockley, and had been taken to Lewisham Hospital, where he was visited by Reverend Gardner. It said that the doctors could find nothing wrong with the young man, although an earlier conversation between young Gordon and Reverend Gardner was revealed in the press at this time. According to the Reverend, Gordon had told him some weeks earlier that he'd felt a sensation within, as if a pen was writing inside him. The words written were, Amen, bad luck to you. This was followed by a feeling of light passing through him. Gordon said this was when the hauntings began, but there was another revelation, an experience that Gordon and Bertie said that they'd shared. They told the family that one night their late mother had appeared to them in their bedroom dressed in red. Even before the boy's story was told, the notion that their mother may have been somehow involved in the haunting had crossed the family's minds. However, Bertie's grandmother said that it could not have been her daughter, because she wouldn't have communicated in such a violent manner. The origins of the 1921 haunting are open to debate. The most commonly accepted theory amongst paranormal investigators is comparable to a horror movie cliché, and lies in the grounds of Ferristone Road itself. The road and its houses had been built on a 700-year-old burial ground in the early 1900s. The last of the dead were interred there only a few years earlier in 1894, despite an 1882 order prohibiting new burials, this order was ignored due to the amount of deceased poor people in the area who clearly could not afford to be interred at nearby Highgate Cemetery. If you take a look around the vicinity of Ferristone Road and nearby St Mary's Church, you will clearly see grave sites scattered close to public footpaths, the boundaries of private back gardens and indeed in the gardens themselves. In 1999, the late David Farrant of the British Psychic and Occult Society paid a visit to 8 Ferristone Road and spoke to Pauline Taylor, the then occupant. She said that during the 18 months she'd lived there, she had discovered some old headstones just below the earth in the garden, and after some light digging, even uncovered some steps, which she believed led into an old crypt. 
Pauline Taylor also mentioned the strange experiences she'd had since living there, like extreme changes in temperature and, more significantly, an odourless plume of smoke which she said rose from the floor of the living room, but did not disperse, rather it imploded. This visit was documented by David Farrant in a 14-minute video, some of which I will show here. Pauline, can I just ask you first, how long have you actually lived in, in the house here? Only 18 months. And I understand there's been some quite weird goings-on, to put it mildly. Oh, definitely. Yeah. My cat picks up on it, not me, for much. But uh, when we started digging the garden, we came across this stone here. And if you dig actually down, it's a flight of stairs. We got down to about four stairs, and then we stopped. I gather we are actually standing on an old, what seems to be an old graveyard, which is per part of a, a ruined church over in the yes, distance. Definitely. Well, there's actually an old grave there, but it hasn't actually got the top on it. But it's half in my garden, half in next doors. Yeah. My neighbours on the other side have actually found headstone in their garden, so... Yeah. Did they have any inscription on them, if anything? The Reverend uh, John Smith and family. Like this actually goes back. Everybody kept telling me it was probably something from the war, it was probably... But I don't think it is. Because we actually put water in there. Yeah. And... Um, it went and went and went and went for about eight hours. And we never ever found out where the level was. Right. So I think this could probably be an old crypt. But, uh, Just going back to what you said about war, civil war, wasn't there a date on this headstone that they found? Have yeah, it was the 1800s. It couldn't really, that sort of rules out yeah. that particular grave being. Well, the thing is that the only thing that could have happened is when they dropped the bombs on Hornsey Station, shrapnel. But I mean, I don't actually see how a whole headstone yeah. would actually come to light. This next clip shows Mr. Farrant and Pauline inside the house, and while talking, rapping noises can be heard. Now it can't be ignored that during the opening seconds of the first clip I showed, there were loud noises coming from a neighbouring house, so it would be fair to argue that the noises heard in this next clip could be coming from the same place, something that David Farrant is quick to acknowledge in the video. But he later wrote in his 2014 blog that all the people present that day felt extremely unnerved by the sounds. In case you'd like to view the entire video, I'll leave a link in the description. Well, in the 1920s, this used to be a family house, whereas now it's been split into four flats. Mm -hmm. But this whole floor was one room. Mm -hmm. So I should imagine the ground floor was probably the cellars. Mm -hmm. Upstairs were the bedrooms. Mm -hmm. But this was sort of a dining room, oh, come kitchen. Yeah. Of course, that wall wouldn't have probably been there anyway. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I've got a living room, bathroom, and a kitchen. So. Yeah, that's interesting because you said about the on the corner we were talking about just now. Didn't you say there was also something in the hallway out there? Yeah, in the hallway. I mean, there, there's a cold spot there which is mm. continuous. Is but that, I mean, the only person who picks up on that is the cat. That's where the cat used to sit. Yeah. And it's as used to be wise, it yep. happens now. Right. It doesn't seem to bother it so much now, I think it's got used to it. Mm. But As you said, it's probably, without being frivolous, a friendly ghost. I think um, it is now. I mean, mm. I know like, the house was exercised years ago, mm. but I mean, there's never a problem now. I mean. What, one thing I meant to, because I'm not quite clear on this, you know when the vicar was called in, in oh, back in the 1920s, mm. were there any further problems to your eyes after we, after we finished the session? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. So Nobody knows. The advisors have got to find out now, wouldn't they? Well, unless... I mean, we can talk to people 
All we can do is talk to people in the present time. Yeah. We can't really go back in time and ask them. Well, what. I mean, unless anybody was living around here at that time, I mean, but I don't know of anybody. Mm. I just want to know, I think we've gone over most things, but is there anything else at all you can think of that's happened? Not really. You know, I mean, other than sometimes it's very cold, but I don't really take any notice of that. Mm. I mean, as long as I don't get <coughs> any aggravation, <laughs> which I don't. I mean, there's... So you... I like the place. I mean, it's... Um, it's a question of, of that you've learned to live with it. Well, be fair to obviously, say that. yeah. I'd love to know what that noise was. Well, we did Probably the ghost. <laughs> we, we did, that's why I stopped. I'm just presuming it's somebody outside doing some work in the garden. <laughs> While I was reading about this case, I did wonder if there had been reports of a haunting at the house prior to 1921. So I made contact with Della Farrant, the widow of David, an author of 2014's Haunted Highgate, which features the Ferrostone Road case. According to her own investigations, there was another uncannily similar incident at a house in the same area in 1915. The only vague notes from the time mention ornaments being knocked from shelves, tapping and crashing noises, and an incident involving a knife which was found with its blade buried in a door. It's unknown if the house in question was 8 Ferrystone Road, as the full 1915 investigation was never archived. If you're wondering about hauntings and experiences at the house since 1999, you're not alone. I couldn't find anything after David Farrant's investigation, but I did attempt to contact the current occupants on the 13th of November 2021. At the time of the final edit of this video, which is the 27th of December, I haven't had a response. <laughs>